All right, so uh, this is our last lecture uh, covering trees of the world. And so today we'll be going over our trees from Asia. Um, and again, this is going to be continental scale, um, very large land area, and we're just really scratching the surface here. So we'll get again about 16 or so species. So Asia is the largest continent. It's extremely diverse. And much like Europe, it used to be joined with North America as part of one large continent. And so you're going to recognize almost all the families and almost all the genera that we'll cover today. And so as we start off here, uh, we'll talk about ginkgo, ginkgo ACE, ginkgo biloba. Uh, if anyone is interested in ginkgo, there's at least a couple here on campus. Uh, we've got some by some dorms to the south side of campus. I don't know which dorm. Uh, but then we have another one uh, near the biology building, the Miller Science building, I believe on the west side of it. And so you can go find these trees. Right now they might be starting to get their fall color, which would be nice and yellow. So they're very popular ornamentals. And they have uh, this leaf that has dichotomous venation. So each vein splits in half, splits in half, splits in half, and that gives it this fan-like appearance. Often, but not always, they'll have a notch in the middle, which is what gives it the name biloba, the specific epithet. And so as you look at this, it's a broad leaf. You know, this, this is what appears to be the fruit, but it's actually a gymnosperm. So ginkgo is a monotypic gymnosperm. It's the only one left, even in its order. The whole ginkgo ailes has just this one species in it. Um, it's easy to ID once the leaves fall off because it has these really big clunky short shoots. So you'll note the kind of rough gray bark, and then all the short shoots on all the limbs will be very obvious and make identification easy. Ginkgo is a dioecious species. So if you get a male tree, it'll only have um, male stroboli, so pollen cones. But the female trees uh, will have uh, the seed cones, and then they have these vegetative tissues that kind of you know, do the same functioning as a fruit around it. When you buy them ornamentally, often you can pay more to get quote unquote certified fruitless trees, where basically they're just selling you only male trees. And you do that for a reason. Uh, they planted a bunch of ginkgo in the parking lots at Virginia Tech, right by the parking lot where they all the alumni tailgate, right by the football stadium. And shortly before I got there, they had gotten to reproductive maturity and they had gone cheap on their trees. So they had planted many that were male, many that were female. But all the female trees start dropping these things all over the parking lot right around tailgate season. And they're real squishy and kind of gross and they stink. They just smell terrible. And so the alumni complain, they go cut all these trees down and they plant something else. And so, you know, if you're gonna plant these, often people will advocate, pay a little more, get the certified fruitless trees, which is just the males, and then you won't have to worry about um, while they stink, uh, different cultures have taken the seeds, the large seeds in there, um, and cooked them and eaten the seeds, kind of like you would a pumpkin seed, same sort of idea. Ginkgo uh, has an interesting story. It's extinct in the wild, basically. You're never going to walk out into a natural forest anywhere in the world and see a ginkgo tree. Um, and we basically thought it was completely extinct. And then they found it uh, in different Buddhist monasteries uh, out in Asia. Uh, the monks had been preserving it, and now it's planted all over the world as an ornamental tree. So it's never going to go extinct, but it is extinct in the wild. Um, you'll see ginkgo biloba used for all sorts of medicinal purposes, you know, supplements, allegedly to help with memory. So um, I suspect a good set of notes will do you a lot more good on the midterm on Tuesday than taking some ginkgo biloba. Okay, we're starting with the gymnosperm. So here's our next gymnosperm, Dawn Redwood. It's got quite the scientific name on it. Dawn Redwood is Cupress ACE, Metasequoia glyptostroboides. And so there are three real uh, sequoias in the world. So one of you will be giving a, a presentation on redwood and giant sequoia, so who's doing that? Okay, so Lauren will be giving you a presentation on those two. This is the third one. They're all in different genera, so they're related, but not too closely related. But Metasequoia is basically the Chinese sequoia, and it's not nearly as impressive as the two North American ones. It's not the tallest, it's not the largest. Um, it's a big tree, but not that big a tree. 
It had an interesting story in its discovery. And so basically in 1941, they located this fossil. Thought we had a brand new species never before identified in the fossil record. So one scientist described that. Then in 1943, a botanist working in a remote portion of Southwest China found these trees growing along a creek. New tree, never before described. So they thought they had a new tree. So they, they named it something else. They misidentified it at first, then named it. Uh, a couple years later, when they correctly identified it as a new species. But then all this became this huge debate over what the heck this thing was actually called, who had actually discovered it first. And they ended up sending all this stuff to the Harvard herbarium and let them sort it out um, before they, you know, sort of figured out who actually discovered it first and what to call it. So, uh, but whoever discovered it first got to put the really long scientific name on it. This tree, while it is similar to the redwoods and the sequoias here in North America, if you see this tree planted in the southern U.S. and it is planted in the southern U.S., you're going to think it's a bald cypress. It looks almost exactly like bald cypress. So the foliage is deciduous in these feather-like branchlets. That's exactly like bald cypress with one key distinction. The feather-like branchlets on bald cypress do not come out opposite one another. They come out alternate one another. So it has a different leaf arrangement than bald cypress. So that's one good ID feature. You can see the cones kind of look like the round cones that you'll notice on bald cypress, but with a key distinction, you can kind of see it on this one here um, and this one here. They're much more square in cross section. So they look like some sort of squarish barrel when they're closed. And so the cones are a little bit different. They're not a perfect sphere like a bald cypress cone will be. The other thing that you'll notice on Don Redwood, you can see over here, they have very fluted trunks. Whereas bald cypress just tends to be, you know, nice and round more. And so typically each time there's a large limb coming out of the trunk, you'll note that there's kind of a furrow below that limb um, to give that trunk that overall fluted appearance. I've seen these planted in Virginia. I've seen these planted in South Carolina. I wouldn't be sur surprised if they could be planted and survive in parts of Texas. So. Okay, next up we have Sugi which is Cupress A.C. Cryptomeria japonica. There are varieties of this tree only found in Japan, um, but it's been brought to China. Some of the varieties have probably been in China for quite a while. It'll grow in pure stands or in mixed stands, and it's an excellent timber species in Japan. Uh, these trees can get absolutely huge, over 150 feet tall, over 13 feet in DBH, so they can get really big. The wood is rot resistant, light, so it's a really good wood. You can see on this map, it's been planted all over the world. You will see these sometimes in the United States, uh, but when you see it here in the US, it's really used only as an ornamental tree. So it's an urban ornamental. In China and in Japan, they are managing it for timber. For the timber species. Oh. Uh, when you look at it, it has different needles than anything we've seen so far. The closest thing we've seen to it is the immature foliage on eastern red cedar, but it has these four-sided awns or spiky-like needles that are only half an inch or so long. They're whirled around the, the green twigs there. You see a pollen cone on the right, a seed cone on the left here, and so the cones are going to be spared. So really a totally different look than any of the gymnast terms we've covered so far. Here you see a couple photos. This is a planted tree in a botanical garden. There's a person laying under in the shade for sort of context on size. And here's a, a really large tree. There's a person right here and right here seated at the base of it. So you can get a sense of just how big these sugi trees can get. Um, often when you see it planted ornamentally here in the United States, people just call it cryptomeria. They'll call it by the genus. Okay, we've got a, another tree from Southeast Asia, David Ketaleria, Pinaceae family, Ketaleria davidiana. And this is kind of an up and coming ornamental, possibly in the Southeastern United States. Um, it's native to Southeastern Asia where you have warmer climates. So it can handle warm climates, it can handle pretty dry environments. 
does better than many hardwood trees on drier soils. It's kind of rare in China. Here you see a few different species, uh, Portunii, Davidiana, and Eveliniana. Um, and they're not the most common tree at all in China. Uh, but in the southeastern U.S. in areas where the winters are mild, this, this could be a popular ornamental because we don't have fir trees that will grow well this far south. Uh, but people tend to like fir trees because they, you know, they look like a classic Christmas tree. They have that appearance. So these Ketolerias kind of look like fir trees, but they can handle our climate. Um, so here's the cone. So the bracts are much softer than we're used to on our pines. Sorry, not the bracts, the scales. And then it has a feature we haven't really seen on anything yet. It has what we call exserted bracts, E-X-S-E-R-T. So exserted bracts. And what that means on our pines, the bracts are the little wings on the seed. The cone scales are longer than them. So on a closed pine cone, you never see the bracts. But on species like this, and Douglas fir, and some of our other species, here's the, the bract that will be attached to the seed. And it's longer than the scale of a cone, so it sticks out. So that gives the cone a, a unique look. Not completely unique, but unique from what we've seen so far. Again, we've got the kind of fur-like needles, and then rough clay bark. So that was a few of the gymnosperms. Uh, let's spend the rest of the day looking at the different angiosperms. And so this next unit here will kind of focus on tropical species um, or subtropical species. And then I'll move on to more of the temperate, even boreal species. And we'll look at those. So this first is jujube. You recognize the family, the Ramnaceae, Sisyphus mauritania. This is generally a small tree, you know, reaching 40, 50 feet or height, you know, about the same in width if it's open grown. And it's originally native in Asia and India here, um, all the way west to, towards Afghanistan. Uh, but it's been planted all over the world now in different areas, all over Africa, um, all over the Caribbean. It has alternate simple leaves that are usually evergreen in tropical regions. Sometimes in hot, dry summers, they'll lose their leaves for a little while in the middle of the summer. It doesn't have thorns, but it will have these nasty recurved prickles, so you got to be careful with this tree. And then it's known for the fruits. So the fruits kind of look like a smaller version of an apple. Um, they'll have a thin but tough skin on them, and these can be eaten, you know, just like you would eat an apple. Uh, they'll get mealy when they get a little overripe, kind of like an apple tends to. Um, they'll, they'll be stewed, cooked all sorts of different ways by different cultures. Uh, but it's interesting, they have a lot of uh, saponins in them. And so in Ethiopia, they'll actually throw them into the water and they'll stupefy fish. So it stuns the fish and a, a stunned fish is an easy fish to catch. So kind of a, a quirky use uh, for this tree. But it's used mostly for its fruits. Next up is gumhar. Uh, the G in the specific epithet is often silent, so you'll hear this referred to as Verbenaceae malina arborea. So you hear it usually referred to as malina. This is originally native to India and Southeast Asia, but this tree has been planted all over the tropical regions of the world, and it is an excellent tropical timber tree. It's commonly grown in plantations like the one you see here. So if you go out and you go to an average site here in East Texas and you look at a lavalle pine plantation that's being managed just with average level silviculture, not too intensive, not spending too much money on it, you might see it growing at four or five tons per acre per year, okay? A log truck carries 28 and a half tons of wood around here. So it's gonna take you, six, seven years to fill up a truckload of wood with a typical plantation here on an acre of land. They can grow this species closer to 10 tons per acre per year, 11 tons per acre per year on good sites in much of this region. So that means this thing would be filling one of our log trucks around here in two or three years. So it'll grow incredibly rapidly, which means they can put this thing on five to eight year rotations in Brazil and use it for pulp mill. So they'll take it, take it as pulp, they'll feed a pulp mill with it, 
um, and just another five day a year rotation. Um, they've had this in some areas where they'll coppice it. You cut these trees down and the stumps will sprout and you'll get new trees and it grows real quick. And when they do that, they're usually managing it for firewood. Uh, so in many places in India, they still have wood burning stoves. And so they'll use them for firewood, coppicing them in that manner. If you grow it a little slower or on a little bit of a longer rotation, uh, the wood is actually pretty good quality. It can be used for plywood, particle board, all sorts of different stuff. And construction material, dimensional wood. And so they'll use the wood for all sorts of different products. The leaf on it is kind of spade shaped. It'll also have fruits uh, that kind of look like small apples there. So it has fruits as well. But here, here's kind of an example of the wood. And so depending on the, the soil, we'll see this for teak as well, but depending on the soil they'll grow it in, you know, that can change the coloration of the wood a little bit, depending on what micronutrients are available at what levels. But here you have kind of a greenish board, here maybe a little more whitish, uh, but here's, you know, some fancy artwork that they've put together using Malina wood. So very popular wood. And that leads us right into teak, which is also in the Verbenaceae. So um, under the most recent taxonomy, beautyberry has been moved over to the Lamiaceae, the mint family. But you know, there are some similarities here, at least we used to think, between teak, malina, um, and our beautyberry here in the US. There's your range map for teak, where you can see it's originally native to India and Southeast Asia. And teak is one of the most popular tropical timber species in the world. And so here you have a teak plantation right here. These trees might get 25 feet tall in the first three years. So they'll grow very quickly, but where they want it for timber, you can't grow, grow a tree too quickly because if you do, it has very few rings per inch if it's growing in a temperate region. And that tends to indicate to us, hey, it's got a low density, the wood's not strong. Um, with tropical trees, you may not get rings per se, because they're growing year round. Uh, but the same thing, if it puts on diameter too quickly, the wood is usually low density, not as good for dimensional products. And so uh, with teak, when we look at the morphology, the leaves are like a foot long. We'll see big leaf magnolia in lab later this semester. It's gonna look kind of like a big leaf magnolia leaf. You have white clusters of showy flowers going to these white capsules in terms of the fruits, but the wood is the main thing. You can make all sorts of different products out of teak. And so you see the top right, they've used it as decking on an expensive looking boat. So they'll use it for watercraft, high-end watercraft, high-end outdoor furniture, or other outdoor living spaces. The wood's pretty rot resistant. And so it'll, it'll resist decay for a long time. Uh, with teak and malina, they've got evidence on both these species that contact with the soil, it might last 15 years. So extremely rot resistant. You see some of the logs they're harvesting down here and variation in color on the wood. Um, back when Culhavy uh, first started here in the late 70s, you know, we didn't have the internet or anything like that. So our college was putting out all these little books and they would be, here's silviculture for lava olive pine, silviculture for short leaf pine, silviculture for bottom land hardwoods. Here's a directory of all the different mills in our area. So we had this little publication series um, and our 24th of them for whatever reason was silviculture and management of teak. And so it looks like we had a visiting professor here, um, Dr. Katamambi, um, and he put together basically, you know, everything you need to know to manage teak um, in the 70s in India and published it here through SFA. So uh, kind of interesting there. Okay, so this is a new one I've added for this semester. This is gutta percha, and it's Sapitaceae family. We're learning chinam wood this week, so same family as chinam wood, and it's Palaquium gut. Palaquium gut. Um, so you can see the leaves on it are nice and ob ovate. We're going to learn pawpaw later this semester. It has similar shaped leaves to pawpaw, and it's a tree that'll grow rapidly. It'll self prune up real well, and so it'll, it'll be a, a decent tree. Um, and you'll find it in India, Southeast Asia. You can see the range map over here and some of the other areas where it's been spread. Now it's called gutta percha 
That's referring to the latex this tree exudes. So if an insect bores into it, it starts exuding this grayish latex as a defense mechanism. The insect gets gummed up in this sticky latex. Then the latex dries out and hardens. And so it's a defense mechanism for the tree. But people started figuring out that this was a pretty cool substance. And so they would take the trees, they would carve into them, they would get it to exude this latex. And local people in Southeast Asia were using this to make machete handles. It was basically a plastic. You could heat this stuff up to about 150 degrees Fahrenheit, 160 degrees Fahrenheit, shape it however you wanted, cool it back down. And it was basically like a plastic product before plastics were even invented. And so once they figured this out, that the British, you know, show up, of course. And uh, in the 1840s, a British doctor sends a sample back to England and they go crazy over this stuff because there's no other natural material that'll do this. And we don't have those synthetic materials yet. And so golf balls in the early 1800s, they were a bunch of feathers stuck together with leather wrapped around them. And as you would imagine, they didn't go very far. Well, they started making them out of gutta percha and they worked way better, they were way cheaper. And so for 50 years, this is how golf balls were made until they found stuff from another tree, rubber, and they started using bound uh, strings of rubber on the inside of golf balls. You could mold silverware with it, chess pieces, all sorts of different things. And so they started going, cutting down all these trees, they would just cut down the whole tree and they would get a few pounds of this latex out of each tree. And then they started putting in plantations of these gutta percha trees because they were running out of them. And this became a massive industry in Southeast Asia. In the mid 1800s, they figured out that this could be used to coat copper wire. And so they had started doing telegraph lines and they wanted to run them, the, the British had this vast empire, and so they wanted to run them across oceans, but obviously electricity plus seawater, that doesn't go well together. And so what became today's Siemens company, Siemens Electronics, they got their start when they figured out how to coat copper wire with resin from this tree, gutta percha, seamlessly. And the British then from 1860 to 1911, built what they called the red line. And it was a quarter of a million miles of telegraph line running underneath the oceans across their entire empire. And they were really forward thinking in how they built this. Um, if you looked at the connection in England, it had like 43 different connections to all these areas. Even some of the remote, more remote areas like Australia and New Zealand would have four or five different connections. So they got all this done about 1911, huge industry, huge effort. And then World War I breaks out where England and the Germans are fighting. And Germany didn't have nearly as sophisticated a system of telegraph lines. So the British were able to you know, destroy and break through their telegraph lines in different places, disrupt their communications and gain an advantage in their war effort. The Germans were never able to fully disrupt the British telegraph system because it had so many redundancies. And so that was one reason that they were able to prevail in World War I. And so a lot of it was because of this one tree they found in Southeast Asia and the weird latex that it exuded. So. This is still used today. So uh, back in, I guess, April at the middle of that COVID semester, I got the first cavity I've ever had went all the way to a root canal. And apparently they still use this stuff today in modern root canals, where they, they dig out the, the roots of your tooth here. Um, and then it's just the perfect substance. They'll stick gutta percha down in there. They'll heat it up so it's moldable. They'll pack it down in there. And it's just the right consistency where they can then mount um, little posts in it that they put your filling on and then ultimately your crown on. Uh, so, you know, most of you have probably never heard of this tree. Some of you might have some of it in your mouth right now. So still in use today. Okay, so that was a few different tropical hardwoods. Next up, I wanna look at some uh, temperate hardwood species. And uh, many of these are either ornamentals in the United States or invasive species in the United States. So let's start with Siberian elm. 
this is Olmaceae ulmus pumila. Uh, and when you look at Siberian elm, it looks like our other elms, except tiny little leaves, tiny twigs. So compared to the elms we've learned, it's got little bitty leaves. We're going to learn cedar elm, which is native to East Texas, and we're going to learn Chinese elm, which is an ornamental here later this semester in lab. And this has leaves smaller even than Chinese elm. Chinese elm has tiny little leaves. Chinese elm is almost parvifolia, which means small leaves. Um, so very small leaves. Here are the Samaras on it, and those are, you know, exaggerated in size. They'll be half the size of a dime. So very small little Samara. This tree has been planted all over the U.S. as an ornamental. Uh, it's too hot here in Texas, so we won't see it here. Uh, but no one really knows why we've been planting this thing as an ornamental. Because it gets these ugly giant burls all over it. Um, you know, it, it just has this terrible form. These were growing in Blacksburg, Virginia when I lived there, and you could spot them leaf off from a block away because it's literally just like the grayest, bleakest tree you've ever seen. And so it's got that real gray form. It always has the burls all over it. And then all the elms do this to some extent, but Siberian elm really does it. You noticed on the American elm we learned by our ag pond, it had some discoloration in places on the trunk. Well, when you get an injury in the tree or a branch is pruned or something like that, um, what, what will end up happening is bacteria will infect parts of the tree and you'll get this bacterial wet wood and it ends up being an alkaline efflux. And so it's a really high pH. So it'll come down, it'll kill grass, it's high enough pH and it'll stain the trees white. Um, so it's, you know, not the most attractive thing that you'll see. Uh, there, there's a guy at University of Georgia who writes kind of the manuals that a lot of the horticulture folks use and urban forestry folks use. Uh, his name is Michael Durr. And so he's got a handbook for ornamental plants in the U.S. focused on trees. And so he'll break down all the different cultivars of all these trees, species, lots of detail. But he's got a really quirky writing style because you'll be looking in the description of a tree and it won't just be what we're used to seeing on fact sheets where it's leaves, twigs, fruit, flower, bark, all this stuff. He puts in random anecdotes with zero context. So it'll say, you know, Jane and I were taking a walk and saw a pretty one of these on one April morning or something random like that. Well, if you look in the Siberian elm section, apparently he doesn't like this tree uh, because of these form issues. And so the section of this textbook literally reads, there's one of these present on the northeastern corner of UGA's campus. I would look the other way if someone showed up at night with a chainsaw and took care of it. So <laughs> he's suggesting the students go out and saw down this Siberian elm. So why do we see it planted so much? Uh, there's one problem with this tree. I mentioned the small leaves, the slender twigs. That looks pretty darn similar to Chinese elm. Chinese elm that we'll see in lab is this beautiful tree. It's got this cool jigsaw puzzle looking bark that's orange and white. Um, it's got like this perfectly symmetrical crown. It doesn't get these burls on it. It's a smaller tree often. So it, it's just this beautiful urban tree. But as seedlings, that tree and this tree are very difficult to tell apart. So they'll get them mixed up in the nursery. They'll sell, you know, a city forester, a bunch of seedlings saying they're Chinese elm. They'll go plant a line of Chinese elm down in a park, and then you come back 10 years later, and it's beautiful Chinese elm, beautiful Chinese elm, Siberian elm. And so <laughs> you either got to cut them down and try and plant something else or live with that. So not the prettiest tree. Next up, we have Cusa dogwood, Cornacee cornus Cusa. It's native to Japan. These are the USDA hardiness zones where it'll do okay in the U.S. So it's a commonly planted ornamental here in the United States. If you all saw this tree, you would know 100% that it was a dogwood, unless you're one of the few people that's still missing dogwood on every quiz question. But uh, it looks very similar to our Cornus Florida. The flowers are very similar, except our Cornus Florida flowers tend to have notches in these bracts. Um, the leaves are slightly darker green, but they look just like Cornus Florida leaves. I don't have a great picture of the bark. You've got a picture of the bark up there on the right. It'll get finely blocky, but then when it gets bigger, it tends to start peeling apart in these plates. So the bark will look a little different, but then the fruits are not the same at all. 
Our flowering dogwood here is going to have clusters of red football shaped little droops. Um, and they look nothing like these weird, I don't know, Willy Wonka candy, space alien egg. I mean, just bizarre looking fruits here. They're edible. You can pluck these off Kusa dogwoods and eat them. So if you ever see a dogwood and it's fruiting and that's on it, nothing's wrong with the tree. It's just a Kusa dogwood. Well, why are we planting so much Kusa dogwood in the U.S. when we have our great native flowering dogwood we could be planting? Uh, an introduced disease, dogwood anthracnose, which is Discula destructiva, has been coming into the U.S. for decades now. Uh, the lighter shade here is flowering dogwoods range. The darker shade is the area impacted by dogwood anthracnose. As of 1995, um, I spent half an hour looking for a more recent range map and came up with nothing. So. I don't know if many people are doing much research on this disease these days, but it'll get in there and it'll get into the leaves and kill them. It'll, you know, take all the, you know, the flowers, you know, it'll take all the aesthetics out of them when it gets in there and it'll eventually kill the dogwood. The Cornus Cusa dogwood, Cusa dogwood, it co-evolved with the pathogen, so it's resistant to it. And so nurseries don't want to sell you a tree you're going to plant, it's then going to die, and then you go complain to the nursery. So many of them have quit selling flowering dogwood and they'll just sell Kusa dogwood instead because it's a very similar tree. So, um, I don't think dogwood anthracnose is really going to completely extirpate flowering dogwood within its range, so it's not like we're going to lose it, but it's just not quite as good of an ornamental tree as it used to be. Okay, next up we have Royal Polonia. Another common name for this is Princess Tree. Uh, so for Soma Culture Lab this week, uh, we were heading up on 59 towards Garrison, uh, and there's like a little RV park with a fancy white fence on the left side of the road, the west side of the road there if you're heading north, and it's got a bunch of big nice trees planted in a line and an otherwise kind of open pasture. Those are princess trees. So we've got these things planted here in Nacogdoches County. Um, I've seen one or two of them if you're heading uh, west of town on 7. Uh, on the north side of the road in people's yards. So we have these things around. This is a map. You've seen maps like this before, right? That's from the Invasive Plant Atlas. So Princess Tree, Scrofularia C. Polonia tomentosa, it's really invasive right in here. It's a bad invasive problem in the southern Appalachians. We've got it planted around here. It doesn't seem too invasive yet. That doesn't mean it doesn't have that potential. People like planting it in part because it has these real pretty pale purple flowers. So it's a showy flowering tree in early spring. It gets capsules on it that may be reminiscent in size and shape of pecans. So kind of has that look. This is a great winter ID feature. You see all these capsules hanging up in the tree after the leaves have dropped. It's super easy to identify from the leaf. The leaves will be opposite. And they're kind of, they may remind you of something like sycamore, uh, but not quite like sycamore. I've seen these in North Carolina. If you cut them down and then they stump sprout, the stump sprouts will grow rapidly, 10 to 15 feet in height in a given year. But when you look at seedlings of princess tree, or if you look at those stump sprouts especially, it's the biggest simple leaf you'll probably see anywhere in the South. The, the single leaves can literally be that big. They're enormous. Um, on a mature tree, the leaves are going to be about the size of red mulberry or sycamore. They're a normal sized leaf, but on a stump sprout or a seedling, they get absolutely huge. You can see this is a pretty big one. There's a person's hand right here for context. So really large leaf. Um, the flower buds on this tree are another dead giveaway. They're an easy ID feature. Um, so it looks like that alien eye that pops out in the trash compactor in Star Wars or something. Uh, E.T.'s head, it's got some weird, bizarre alien head kind of look to it. So that stocked flower bud. The bark on them is going to look a lot like what we saw on Tree of Heaven or on Silk Tree, where it's got kind of like a smooth gray but cantaloupe rind-like texture. So uh, this is an invasive here in the U.S. And as with many of our invasives, we kind of did this to ourselves. Uh, so people went over to China looking for you know, ways to make money. And there's a wine case made out of wood from Royal Polonia. 
But apparently there's a big market, or at least there was at the time, where people would make small religious icons. They would carve them out of royal polonia, and they would sell those for pretty high value. And so people thought we can grow this better in the US South, and we'll send the logs back to China, we'll make a killing. And so they brought these trees over, and they, they grew like crazy. They grew really fast. And then they sent the logs back to China, and they were worthless. They grew too fast. It turns out the use of this in China was coming through trees that grew slowly, lots of rings per inch, high density wood, high value wood. When you grew them too fast here in the US, too, too few rings per inch, the wood was worthless. Uh, they also never quite got the stem form down. They never really got them to grow that straight, like you see on this guideline still advocating planting polonia for all, all reasons. But they, they never got the stem form down, and uh, oops, it's invasive. So you'll occasionally see a bunch of them planted, mostly as an ornamental today, but not recommended for planting. Okay, here's Russian olive. You're probably lucky you don't have to put this scientific name on a quiz out in the field, right? A lot of A's and E's in a weird combination. So this is Elaginaceae, Elaginus, and Gustafolia. This is our only example of one of these olives this semester. And I picked an example you find in the western U.S., uh, but we often find autumn olive in the eastern U.S. They planted it on a lot of reclaimed mine lands in the Appalachian region, and oops, it's super invasive. If you find something in the Eleagnaceae family and in the Eleagnes genus, one of these olives, it doesn't look like any of the olives you get on a salad bar at all. It's not like a black olive or a green olive with a pit. It looks like a tiny pear is the fruit. So it'll look like what we'll see on calorie pear in terms of a fruit. So it looks about the size of a cherry, but the texture is more pear-like. Uh, so the seed is dispersed by birds on all of them. So they get dispersed far and wide. And then how you identify it. Every time I've seen one of these things, you take a leaf, you flip it over to the back, and it looks like someone got out a can of silver shiny spray paint and spray painted the back of the leaf a shiny silver. So the backs of the leaves are literally shiny and silver. We've seen nothing like it. The closest we've seen is maybe Sweet Bay, but that was white. This is silver. And so if you're ever, you know, in an area where you would find invasive species roadside, parking lot, some disturbed area, and you see a, a silver leaf, it's probably a, an invasive olive. Now, Russian olive can really take over the western U.S. as a bad invasive shrub. So it's all these lighter colored ones, because from far away, that's what that silver back of the leaf is looking like. And so you can see it out there, all the native vegetation and what might have been more of a juniper woodland is now being over encroached by Russian olive. And the creeks here are probably drying up, right? It'll dry up ephemeral streams. Here's what it looks like up close, and you can see that silver back to the leaf. The photo doesn't even really do it justice. It'll be real silver. And then there's the fruits. Those will be about the size of a quarter. Here's a big one growing by a reservoir. So you can see they'll get 20, 30 feet tall. Uh, pretty good sized if they have enough water. When we were in China, so there's Dr. Oswald, we were out in this area where they had a lot of salty soils, saline soils. It turns out the river coming out of the mountains was cutting through an area where they had a lot of salt deposits from inland seas that had formed that parent material eons ago. And so in China, they're trying to get something growing on every acre they've got because they have, what, 1.3 billion people now. So they're trying to make the land as productive as possible. So they're even trying to use these areas with saline soils where not much will grow. So they're just trying to find anything they can grow there that they can use for any sort of crop. So they're trying stuff out and we're going touring with them and we've never heard of most of the plants they're talking about. And of course, there's lots of translations back and forth. So they're talking about this silver willow for like two days and we're looking at it and being, you know, looking at it like this definitely isn't a willow. We know it's not salix. And then finally, we get a scientific name out of someone on it, and it's been Russian olive the whole time. So this Russian olive is so hardy that they're planting it in these salty soils, and it's the best thing they've got that'll survive out there. The soils are killing pretty much every other plant they try. So this is a really, really hardy species. Okay, next up we have camphor tree. 
So it's in the Loraceae family, Cinnamomum camphora. So this is a popular ornamental here along the Gulf Coast. And so you will see these planted. They've got evergreen, dark, shiny leaves. They can get pretty big. You can extract camphor oil from these trees. So if you look at products like Vicks Vaporub, they may list ingredients like camphor oil. And it's one of these oils you can rub on your skin and it gives you that cooling sort of menthol feeling. But you gotta be careful with camphor oil because it will also cause a lot of irritation in me. Um, so this oil can actually be pretty toxic. You have to be careful with it. Here's the dark green evergreen leaves. There's the real dark brown blackish fruits. Um, and so people have been using the oil and use too much of it, and it, it has some significant toxicity to it. So camphor has been grown throughout the world in plantations for the oils. Um, and this is showing you how invasive it is in Florida. And so this is a stand that was invaded by camphor tree and uh, kind of a subtle feature, but if you start looking close, what you'll notice, they put pink flagging on all the camphor trees. So there, 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 there. There, there, here, there, there, here. So it's basically all the trees. Yeah, from Florida. So Florida does have a lot of invasive species. So first off, you have a lot of people, so they're bringing a lot of things. But then the other thing that's going on, Florida and South Texas are the only areas in the continental United States that have subtropical climates. So if we bring in an invasive species that can only thrive in a subtropical climate, it's only gonna make it in South Florida or South Texas. So that's why we're seeing species like Melaleuca, Shinus, and others, where they're not a problem in the US except South Florida, South Texas. Yeah. So it's just completely different ecoregions. So, but they're not getting some of the temperate invasive species, like they wouldn't be getting uh, the Norway maple we talked about. Um, so they're avoiding a lot of the temperate invasive species. So it, it's, it's a pretty bad pest in some areas. Wait, why are we covering this one in the uh, temperate interest rates? Yeah, I'm kind of jumping around a little. Oh, yeah, okay. it'll grow a little further north. You can see where not put the range at. It's a really tough thing. Yeah, so it, I mean, the subtropical regions are really kind of here and here. Okay. So, you yeah. know, we're in the temperate eco region here in Texas, East Texas at least. Okay, uh, next up is paper mulberry. Moraceae, brucinetia, papyrifera. Um, and so you can see it's not in the mulberry genus, it's in its own genus, brucinetia. I have seen these along the Lenana Creek Trail, so we've got some of them here in Nacogdoches County. I've seen a lot of them over in like Baton Rouge. And so we, we do have this around our region. Paper mulberry will look very similar to our red mulberry, which is native. If you grab this leaf, it will not be sandpapery. So the leaf texture is not sandpapery, like our native mulberry is. The fruits are really weird. So it doesn't have a mulberry fruit, which would look like a blackberry. Um, it's got this round fruit um, that would resemble sycamore or button bush, maybe. And then how I always ID these things when I notice them, you get the twig, and the twig is very gray, and it is woolly. Okay, it's as woolly as a wool sock. Okay, so it's one of the wooliest twigs we'll have on any species. And once you see that in a mulberry leaf, you pretty much know you've got a paper mulberry. So look for the woolly twigs. It's called paper mulberry. Um, this tree has been pulped for centuries. Um, and then the, the pulp has been used to make paper. Not as much commercially nowadays, but there's still, of course, interest in people making craft paper, sort of hobbyist sort of crafts, they will still use paper mulberry today. That's how it got the name paper. Here's a very similar tree, white mulberry, or AC Morris alba. And anytime you see an invasive tree in an ag field, you know that's a pretty hardy invasive tree. They use lots of herbicides in agriculture, lots, way more than we use in forest. White mulberry is invasive all over the place. Uh, but you can kind of see the center of it here in the central hardwoods region, the lake states. I think the only state with every county highlighted there is Indiana. Um, my mom's got a lot of family up in Muncie, Indiana, kind of northern Indiana. And we used to go to one of my uncle's house, and he had one of these 
uh, white mulberries planted in his backyard. I remember seeing them when we were kids. Went back there five years ago, and there are thousands of these things in his backyard now. So it's just completely taken over. So really bad invasive species. Easy to recognize. Looks like red mulberry. Except if that was a red mulberry fruit, it would be red. White mulberry has a dark or blackish colored fruit. The leaves also will not be sandpapery like our red mulberry. So, white mulberry became invasive. Um, so, silk came out of China. Um, and it turns out, silk comes, of course, from the silkworm, which is really a caterpillar. But the caterpillar feeds primarily on white mulberry leaves. And so an intrepid businessman went out, went to China, got some silkworms, got some white mulberries, brought, brought them back into the US, was gonna make a fortune. The whole operation went bankrupt, but he left the mulberry trees out there. And that's where they started spreading from. So it was from a failed silk operation. Um, so I found out putting this lecture together, when you Google image search silk, it takes you to about page three, where you find something you can show in a lecture. So there's Tide. We've got one more species here today. This is multiflora rose. And so this has got a really convenient scientific name on it, Rosa multiflora. So it's basically the same thing backwards. And so we have a number of different native and non-native roses here in East Texas, Cherokee rose and others. Um, you occasionally see a multiflora rose in Texas, as you can see from the range map there. Uh, this is an invasive species in much of the Eastern US. And it forms these thick brambles. So it's like half shrub, half vine. So it's forming a, a dense thicket of, or a bramble. They're easy to identify. You'll have the small stems being green with a dark brown prickle on them. These prickles are curved, they're nasty, they'll tear you up. You've got a pinnately compound leaf and it'll often have prickles on the petiole and on the rachis there. You have showy five petaled white flowers. And then there's the red fruit. Anyone know what the fruit on a rose is going to be called? So usually those are called rose hips. Rose hips. H-I-P-S. And so people will harvest those, um, use it to make tea, uh, just eat them. And so it's got a little bit of sort of fruit value to it. But really it's just an invasive pest. It forms those thickets. And so whether it's recreation, um, or if you're dealing with livestock, or if you're dealing with wildlife, it forms these large barriers, just areas where it's really difficult to get through. And it's difficult to control because it has a whole bunch of stems. It's not something you can hack and squirt or anything like that. You're probably gonna have to use a foliar or herbicide and spray the whole thing uh, if you wanna get any sort of control on it. So there's one example of a rose. So that's it for trees of Asia.